Let me share my screen and start the presentation. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. 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 Uh, so today I want to discuss distributed systems and patterns there. So it is obviously a broad topic, so we can't cover it all, but I want to like remind or um, um, recap some basic terminology, basic concept, and dive deep to some patterns and explain it in the simplest words that I can, so that we all will uh, recap it. So uh, idea is to discuss distributed systems, uh, some challenges that they introduce to a quick existing patterns overview and dive deep in next like four patterns. So for me, I see some gap between what we have in like Golang tutorials where we like, okay, let's do some service, REST API and do like database connection and between real world system like let's make YouTube clone or Twitter clone and we have like petabytes of data, we have thousands of transactions per requests per second and like a um, billion daily active users. So that's where we actually need to design and write some code that will be basically a distributed system. So distributed system is any environment where we have multiple computers or devices or servers uh, that doing concurrently same or different tasks. Uh, when we speak about distributed systems, we obviously imagine something like that, but in reality we have something like that and it is actually a pretty simple diagram I believe that if we draw YouTube or Twitter or Tinder or anything, we will not fit in one page even closely. So there are a lot to discuss. Let's start. And obviously you can ask questions. So what um, we have, what possibilities we have with distributed systems. It is obviously scalability and flexibility. That means that we can add some more services and improve our performance. And uh, during some peak hours, we can grow. And when it is night, uh, non-business hours, we can scale down. We have full tolerance. If one part of our system fails, a uh, system still should proceed working. We have reliability, like if we have some well-designed distributed system and well-implemented, obviously, we could withstand some failures. We should have better speed. So if we uh, scale our database or scale our servers, we will have better performance that, than if we have one single server. And geo distribution. If we have global organization and we have users all over the world, we could achieve good speed and performance for all of our users. But that introduce some possible issues. We have increased opportunity for failure, even that we told before that we have better fault tolerance. We need to test our fault tolerance. We need to test how will our system work in so if something die. And it is called a disaster recovery testing and we need to do it. We obviously introduce synchronization challenges when we have different databases and different services. We need to have synchronization and it has it could have a lot of errors or data corruption. Scalability is imperfect. If we are doubling our nodes, it doesn't mean by default that we have double performance. We have more complex security when we have distributed system and many nodes and many different services. We introduce new security challenges. And complexity for design, managing, maintaining, developing, and understanding how our system works. So 
important disclaimer. If we could avoid building distributed system, we should do it. If we have a startup or some MVP and we don't know how many users we will have, how many queries per second we will have, we need to start with the simplest system we can. And this is what sometimes some businesses forget that we need to start with the simplest system possible. So that is very important. I want to recap on that. But we, if we have requirements, non-functional requirements to build distributed system, let's discuss how. Those uh, some patterns that are um, um, like very famous in distributed system, but we will discuss them very quickly because we do not implement that them in code. So ambassador, that is some proxy service that handles communication between components. And that is separate service from ours. It is sometimes used when we have like monolith and we want to split it to some microservices, we could introduce ambassador. Or we just want to have um, loosely coupled system, we could have ambassador service to manage all the communication and our main service does not care about how communication works. Sidecar, it is some supplementary containers that could write logs, write analytics, or just um, have some different versioning for database or communication. And it um, sometimes even run in the same like Kubernetes node with um, our service. So it is called Sidecar. Uh, replicated load balancer just distributes our incoming request to replicated services. Sharded services, um, um, it involves data partitioning to different services or to different nodes in database cluster. And more, like this list could go on and on if you is are interested in this topic, there are a lot to study about. But we'll skip this part for now. I just wanted to recap these names so you will be familiar with it. But I want to dive deep to next patterns. First of them are Command and Query Responsibility Segregation or CQRS. It is pretty simple pattern that tells us that our requests should be divided could be divided to commands and queries, where queries means read request and commands means write requests. And they are done to the two different storages, like commands go to write efficient database and queries go to read efficient database or just read replicas of the same database. And data is synchronized for, for write DB and read DB by some our written service or DB tools. And that will mean that our read queries will be more performant and, um, and less latency. And our write commands also will work better. Those patterns uh, are used in um, read heavy systems but we are introducing synchronization and it will mean that we have eventual consistency. Next example for the same pattern introduces event sourcing. Here we could see that we have order service and our client do some write request or command request. We save the data to database for orders and use CDC events. Uh, that is change data capture events and writes it to message bus. It this messages could be like create order, um, clear up some items in our warehouse or deprecate some items in warehouse, any uh, change events for our data. And this data from our message bus, that could be Kafka, CQS, RadiusMQ, anything goes to some 
data transformation or the transformation service that persists the data to read efficient database. And all read requests goes to read efficient database. So let's um, see some implementation in Go. So here is like, okay, let's open it in my idea, okay. And so I will have all examples in GitHub to like, if you need to review them later, I will go um, quickly on them because we have like four different examples. So we implement something like interface for commands and queries. So write operations and read operations. And each comment or query is implemented separately. And we have something like execute this, um, like create user comment or write comment. And we do that to some write efficient storage. So here we have just print of some data. And we implement the same queries where we read data from some read efficient storage. Um, here I implemented some handlers and like we could read data and write data. Um, I could show it as just like basic service that have read and writes, but we could imagine that we could do the same. So we could get some data and we could post some data. We could do the same in big system where we write to some Cassandra storage because it is write efficient and read from some storage where we could run search queries or analytics queries like um, it could be relational database or it could be some search engine like Elastic and we could do requests to two separate places and run all the handlers through some message bus. Okay, so any question here? Because I will be moving forward. Okay. Uh, one more example here. So this is implementation of simple secure as database, Go secure as a library, not database. And here we have implementation with message bus. Uh, we have um, some libraries here that has dispatcher for commands and we could register all um, event bus handlers here and register it in our dispatcher. I will go quickly through that code so you could come back to it later. We have some storage here. We use in-memory storage here, but we could use some site storage here. And all of these commands are registered to dispatch. And here, as example, we have create inventory, deactivate inventory, rename inventory, check some items in inventory, and remove items. And we have the same service here and some comments to get inventory or like do all comments add, remove details, deactivate and so on. I tested it, it works pretty good. So you could use it uh, as example to start your code. Okay, if no question, let's move forward. Okay, so next pattern is two-phase commit. Before discussing it, I want to recap that we have two types of consistency, eventual consistency and strong consistency. We actually have more, there are some mixed types of consistency, but let's discuss those too. So eventual consistency means that we don't care if we get updated information a bit later. Like when we are scrolling, Instagram and we look on the post and we don't see the latest likes number or comments number, we are okay with like some seconds or even minutes delay. On the other hand, we have examples of use cases where we need strong consistency, like when we are paying with debit card and we really need to have information consistency. We can't spend money that we don't have. So two-phase commit is used when we need strong consistency and we need to write data to all the places where it is used. 
So two-phase commit actually means not two phase, but like four phases. And we could follow numbers here. We have some coordinate and coordinator service that do the coordination of commits to services or databases. So this in this pattern, we don't care that it has database or service, no matter what. We do some preparation work by going to services and saying, please prepare to run this commit like acquire some log that will mean I will do that commit. The service is committing, like I will acquire this log and no other uh, commits will be done in this time and I will do what you will ask me to. Then coordinator sends commit this message to both services and it is committed in database or service. So we do that like it can be done synchronously but we wait for this and this after that we do commit and we actually commit data here in the fin final storage so uh, what advantages here are like we have strong consistency we have atomicity because when we acquire work nothing could be changed in the same storage and it is simple this like protocol or pattern is simple but we have pitfalls that it is hard to scale if we have two services that's okay um, if we have more that could be a problem and our coordinator becomes single point of failure like if it fails the entire transaction fails and performance is significantly significantly impacted by this waiting and acquiring lock and commits. When it could be used, for example, when we have sharded database and we have like master shard, primary shard and some shard with data, but we need to send data about some users or clients to both shards because it is only two shards, not not more, not like five. So it is okay. Um, maybe we need to send data to two different services like payment service and inventory service. There are only two and that's okay. So here we have some, okay, let's open it in Go Playground, some code examples. So we have participants and here we can have more than two, but like, I don't think we need to do that for more than two participants. It's a lot of waiting. And we have coordinator with mutex, obviously, and participant just have ID string. And we could create participant as a slice. We have prepare for participant that for now just write that our participant is prepared and the decision is true. Okay, I acquired log, we can proceed. We have commit, that means, okay, I committed data and we have rollback in case of error. So here could go some like ACID transactions to database. We add participant to coordinator and run all the phases next. Here we have prepare phase, that means like go through all participants and ask them to prepare to run something. And commit phase for coordinator means also go through all participants and ask them to commit. If for all participants prepare stage, return the decision to run this transaction is true. Otherwise we need to roll back. So here we have like two participants uh, to add both of them to coordinator and we run repair phase. We like wait a bit to like simulate some latency and we have commit stage. So let's run it. It will obviously work because all of that are just works. And we have two participants prepared and two participant with committed transaction. Okay, and here we have library for that. It is, okay, I 
can't open it really. Okay, here. So it is library for exactly the same. We could see that code is very similar. It is go SQL to face commit to PC, and we open like two Postgres connection. We do some preparation, like some database, uh, create, create table for testing. And we add participants to like two phase that is like coordinator. We add participants and we run command, like do this command. Um, we add two params our participants. And it do exactly the same as we just saw. So this is like not very popular library, but it was in awesome Go, so I suppose it works. Uh, I tested it, so it was okay. Any questions for this two-phase commit? Oh, one question. Uh, yeah. So now uh, one coordinator and couple of services. And yeah, uh, so they execute, uh, may be executed in parallel. So it's not like serial um, um, list of operations. So firstly, we uh, executing the transaction on service one and then using this result to uh, start service two transaction or it's completely like different and not connected operations. So they could run in parallel, like you can send that prepare a calls uh, in like go routines, that's not problem. Mm -hmm. But we won't send commit message before we actually get the result that prepare returned from all our participants. Okay. So if, in real world, we actually we want to run that prepare stages like in go routines. Uh, and then we could run commit messages in Goroutines, but we will wait for all that prepare and acquire log before running commit. Okay, so if operation will fail on service one, then service two won't start and also will fail. Right? It won't start commit, yeah. So mm -hmm. if at least one of participant return that prepare was not successful, then instead of commit, we will run rollback, like release the log, don't do anything. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so next pattern. Well, just, just a question, yeah. just a question, just thinking out loud, it's not mm -hmm. maybe not even a question, but it seems, you know, the two-phase commit is kind of a protocol, yeah, it's kind of agnostic, but yeah. At the same time, the coordinator needs to have kind of big knowledge about the underlying systems, yeah? So the one that you showed, for example, works for PostgreSQL, yeah? So uh, are there any, uh, are there more like uh, libraries to, to handle, I don't know, REST API, two-phase commits, or, you know, those kind yeah. of implementations, let's say, of, of the protocol? Is it popular? Yeah, uh, I will show it actually later. So I have one library in examples that can do what you just said, do the same, but for different protocols. So we'll get to it, okay? Let's discuss one more pattern and I'll um, show it. Okay. okay, thanks. Great. So next pattern is Saga pattern. Uh, we actually had whole topic about Saga pattern done by Ivan Kutuzov, and I have it in links in the end of um, this presentation, but if you missed it, we will cover it quickly. So uh, this pattern means to maintain data consistency across services with a sequence of local transactions in each service that are coordinated by some asynchronous messaging like message bus. And if in any service our transaction fail, then we want to compensate our transaction in all of previous services. So we go to service one, transaction is committed. We go to service two, transaction is committed. We go to service three and transaction failed for some reason. Then we go back to service two and compensate our transaction and we go to service one and compensate our transactions. So system in, is in the same state that it was before our like job. So if 
service three was committed, then we end on this step. So Com compensate it's like rollback or it's something different. It could be a rollback, but a rollback means that we start transaction and we commit or rollback, but we already committed. So it is not actually okay. a rollback. It is called compensated because um, rollback, it's like an alter alternative to commit, but we already done commit. We already saved data, data to database. So it's called compensated because we just update to previous data. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have two um, ways how to do that saga pattern and it called choreography based and orchestration based. By this diagram, I kind of could see why it called. It is called choreography based because it is like some dancing between services. I'm not sure why it is named like that, but it's my suggestion. So we have message broker and we have three services and some of the services could publish two topics or subscribe to the topics. So microservice one will publish two event topic one, like do something. And service two and service three are like, okay, we will do that. Then microservice two will publish something to topic two. And microservice three will listen to it and do something and publish something to topic three and microservice one and microservice two will listen to it. So this implementation is easier than next one, but if we have a lot of services, it is not suitable. So it could work for like two services, maximum three. Do not do that if you have more than three services or like databases. And um, I missed to tell it, but um, this pattern is uh, used a lot when we have like database per, per service. So we could imagine that each service is responsible for some business domain and it has its own database access. So that's why we can't just save data from microservice one to three databases. We actually have access to this database from this service and the same for other services. Okay, so next is orchestration-based saga pattern. Here we have some orchestrator that um, have its separate response topic. So it have all um, request channels for different services and it get response through one service. So here, if we want to send command to microservice two, we send to this topic, to microservice three, to this topic, and actually orchestrator could send something to microservice one, which has the orchestrator. But all the responses will go through Saga orchestrator response channel. And orchestrator will like tell, okay, we, Committed, 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 we are good. Committed, committed, failed, like compensate, compensate. And compensated messages will be sent to same channels where we send our actual commands. It is very simplified explanation of Saga pattern, but I hope you grasped the idea and we'll like review quick example here. Also, it is very simplified. So we have some steps. It is some step in Saga. We have Saga orchestrator here that has slice of steps. Executing of Saga means that we want to go through all the steps and run it with some functions that we have in our step. And it is successful. So example of jobs could be some reserve something in inventory, process payment, ship order, something like that. And we could execute it. And as you saw here, we don't have any compensation jobs because it was too complex to write from scratch in like a small time that I had. So let's see example of existing library. And like any questions about that, we just run all the steps from the list 
and they are successful. But we ob obviously need some message worker for that and compensation jobs. So let's see. We have a um, library for that and it is DFT library. It could do exactly what Michael was asking about, right? That we want to communicate to different databases and different services. And it implements not one pattern, but it has Saga. Okay, sorry. It has Saga, um, TCC, that means try, commit, cancel. That is um, a bit um, similar to, to face commit. It has XA. It is like two-phase commit with extension. So it implements a lot of different patterns and we could look at that. It is called DTF and it sometimes has not a good translation, but it actually do its job. So it could be used to different like orders and it is language agnostic, it implements different distributed transaction, it's easy to use. So it depends either on MySQL or on Redis for that orchestration. And we have examples here, like we run DTM CLI, new saga, and we add some transactions here and do submit. So it should be easy, but I had not tried it. So like if you need it, you can check and tell us if it works. And it has a lot of examples here. Okay. So there are some more libraries like I found like 15 different libraries in Go that implement that, but none of them is like community chosen that is, this is the best. So if you need to implement such distributed transactions, you need to research what is better for your use case. But we have a lot already. Okay, any questions for that saga pattern? Let's move forward. So next pattern, it is for like algorithm probably because I want to speak about hashing. When we have distributed system, we are using hashing a lot because we need to distribute data for our nodes. So it is more like common algorithm. It could be used in distributed database, in distributed load balancing, in distributed caching in distributed storage. So in traditional hashing, we like have model operator. Like we have here three services, three nodes, A, B, C. We have some data, we hash it to some numbers and we do like model three and we have two, zero or one, and it is distributed to ABC. It is It works evenly, so like, what's the problem? So problem is with rehashing. If one of our servers crashes or become unavailable, we need to change. We now use hash by model two. And here we could see that our distribution changed and even evenly, but we updated data from uh, servers that were not impacted. So like here we have Bill and Steve in A and Jane in B, but now we have Bill and Steve in B, but A and B were servers that were non-impacted. So we didn't want to update data in it. We just need to redistribute data from server C. So how we could solve it? we could solve it with consistent hashing algorithm. So it is some algorithm that provides us a way to distribute data to some service, but minimize impact of adding or removing nodes. So it is main idea. It could distribute data not so evenly as other algorithm, but if we want to add or remove nodes frequently, we need to use this consistent hashing. So we minimize, a number of rehashing and data migration. 
and a basic idea is that we map data on a ring and each node is responsible for the keys in its range. So this explanation should ring a bell like Cassandra is using something like this to its partitioning and other databases also do that, uh, not like NoSQL databases. So the same algorithm is used in Cassandra for data partitioning. So you could hear about it in different other places. Where it is used, we discussed before, in distributed caching, in load balancing, in databases, and in CDNs, content distribution networks, where we want to have data close to user and quickly distributed. So rows are uh, we, um, can add or remove nodes without data migration. We balance the load across nodes and we reduce impact of nodes failure. But we have cons here, like we need a good hand has function and we could have hotspots if distribution is not so uniform. How it looks like. So we distribute all our data on a ring and on a ring means that we can have angles between zero and 360. So we can have like degrees here and we distribute it with like pseudo-random algorithm. Now we add our servers and they are also assigned to same degrees. We have A, B and C. And data is associated with the server like counterclockwise or we could use clockwise. It depends on implementation. Here we would use like counterclockwise. So all data that is like in range for C server is on C server. All data that is in range for B server is for B server. And the same here for A server. So to resolve that our issue with adding and removing nodes, we are introducing simple trick like virtual nodes. And we have like four servers, A, B, and C. We introduce some 10 virtual nodes like A0 to A9, the same for B and the same for C and distribute it for angles like we could see here. And data is now associated to some label. For example, B2, John is associated with B2. It's the closest to it and it is assigned to server B. The same here, B is associated for A4 and it is on server A. And we are not even speaking about replicating data here yet. So for removing or adding servers, because we have so many nodes and we could just move it to closest next, we just need to remove a remap key divided by n keys, where key a number of keys and n number of servers. So it's exactly what we want. And there are like white papers that describe why it is mathematically correct, why we, we would not dive to it because it is already a lot of complexity here. Let's try to run it. So I have code here and it is pretty simple because it is using amazing libraries that have done everything for us and it implements exactly consistent hashing but we still need to implement our hasher we need to choose what hash function we want to use so members are our nodes and hasher struct needs to have some 64 like hash function. We use existing library for that. We need to seed random library because we need random data. And we um, create eight nodes here that will be our servers. And we do Configuration for our consistent hashing that includes partition count, replication factor, and load 
um, load factor we could choose that um, numbers by reading documentation of consistent package but like persistent partition count is advised to be prime number because of some mathematical logic that lies under it replication factor is how many times our data need to be replicated in our ring and load means um, like how many Okay, it's hard to explain. How many times our data will be replicated? Okay, so owners are like uh, some data that we want to uh, send to our RIN and we will run it now and see. So we add one more node and we check how many changed, how many data was changed to new members and how many data we need to relocate after that. Let's run it. So our numbers are from 0 to 271. And after we added node, we moved some data to node 9 from node 0, node 2, node 7, and so on. And we had 16% of data relocated in whole ring. And if we calculate like 271 keys divided by, um, we have nine nodes that will be exactly that car divided and numbers that we saw before. So this uh, could be used or sharding or caching or any place where we want to do some consistent caching. And I remind that this is important just when we suppose our nodes number will change a lot. If we have some stable number of that nodes, we could use just simple modular hashing and we don't need such complications. Okay, questions here. Okay, let me proceed. It is actually final slide with some useful link. So Byte Byte Go is some great channel that explains some different patterns and algorithms there and give some advices for interview preparation. So just check the YouTube channel, it's great. And newsletter, you could subscribe to free version, probably some part of it is paid, so it's great. It is um, great um, place to read about consistent hashing and library itself. I have link with all examples here if you will need it for something, but it is like simple implementation. This one is actually great a tutorial for someone who wants to try build like distributed system. It has good articles. It is three dot labs. So two Golang enthusiasts are developing it. They have blog and maybe even YouTube channel and this tutorial are from them. So they include in that tutorial from scratch, like Terraform, Google Cloud Run, they are doing CQRS patterns there, they are introducing some clean code um, refactoring and checking for some security vulnerabilities and adding end-to-end -end tests. That is a great place to like, try some tutorial harder than uh, like write a simple service. So I really recommend it. And that is talk by Ivan Kutuzov about Saga pattern and data consistency in distributed system if you want some follow-up. And that's it.